Welcome to There is a Method to the Madness. My name is Rob Maxwell. I'm an exercise physiologist and personal trainer. I'm the owner of Maxwell's Fitness Programs, and I've been in business since 1994. That is 30 years and a long time, a long good time. The purpose of this podcast is to get to the real deal of what really works, to give you the science, to give you the professionalism, and talk about why things may or may not work. Today, I'm going to speak almost exactly about that, and that's professionalism within the industry. Before I get to that, speaking of professionals, let me thank Jonathan N. Lynn Gilden of the Gilden Group at Realty Pros. They are committed to providing the highest level of customer service, and they have the sales and the reviews to back that up. So give them a shout, 386 386- Four five one, two four one two. Let's talk a little bit about professionalism in the health and fitness industry. We really need it, and it's been one of the things that I have really pushed for years. I would say almost going back to when I first began. I just thought that they're really needed to be standards. So let me start by saying that unfortunately there really aren't standards by law. So there's really no regulation and there's no licensing within the field of say personal training, exercise science, um, exercise medicine professionals with the exception of orthopedic surgeons. In the state of Florida there is zero licensing and very little accountability, especially on the, say, criminal side of law. What I mean by that is that if a trainer or um, allied health professional slips up, makes a mistake, does something they're not supposed to do, they can be sued for negligence and they would have to pay financially, but that's very different from licensing, making sure that everybody is doing what they're supposed to be doing. I'll finish this segment off talking more about licensing, like the pros and cons, but right now I'm going to make the case that there at least needs to be some really good standards in professionalism. When I started out, we used to say that in the next five years, and I'm talking 30 years ago, so this was, again, 1994, I'd say, or we'd say, you know, in the next five years, there's going to be licensing in the state of Florida because it was happening in other parts of the country. And it never happened. And not only did it not happen in Florida, which I guess we shouldn't be too surprised because a lot of times we... uh, you know, aren't the most licensed state, regardless of how you see that. So it really hasn't increased anywhere in the United States. The last I checked, it was only seven states in the nation actually have licensing for personal trainers, and the rest do not. So, I mean, I'm assuming you're not confused as far as, like, what licensing is, I mean, it. there's licenses in almost every profession, but it makes so little sense that we don't have higher standards in the health and fitness industry, especially considering what most people end up talking about, most trainers end up talking about. What most trainers end up working with is are things that absolutely would be licensed and regulated in other fields. So there isn't. I mean, we used to say, and it's not meaning to be the meaning of anybody who does different type of cosmetic work, but let's just say, you know, nail technicians that do manicures and pedicures, like there's licensing there, right? You might say, well, yeah, they got to use chemicals. Okay. 
I'm not disagreeing. I mean, that's a good thing to have somebody else come in to make sure somebody is doing what they're supposed to do. But the point is, is that in the health and fitness world, we don't have that. But in the manicure industry, we do. It makes very little sense. Now, if every personal trainer stuck to their scope of practice, maybe, just maybe, it makes a little sense. I don't even think it really makes sense there, but it really doesn't matter because most trainers do not stick to their scope of practice. I hear it, I see it all the time. The trainers stepping out of their scope of practices, trainers doing different types of massage work, which they are not supposed to do. That is supposed to be in the hands of a licensed massage therapist. Trainers giving out meal plans, which they're absolutely not supposed to do. You need to have the regulations, the licensing, the certifications to do that. Now, with me, just to back up a little bit, I think most people understand or they wouldn't be listening to the show. So I'm an exercise physiologist. I'm a certified personal trainer. I'm a licensed sports nutritionist and I have my CSCS, which is Certified Strength Conditioning Specialist through the NSCA. So I have a master's degree in exercise physiology and I can do more than what most do. So I think that's very important personally and it does drive me nuts when I'm seeing Joe Schmo writing meal plans for somebody on the internet giving out advice. And believe it or not, they're not supposed to do that unless they're a dietitian or a nutritionist. Now, they could be sued. I mean, absolutely that could happen, but that's not really the point. Like the point of this isn't to say, you know, oh, who who's going to get in trouble, who's not going to get in trouble. I mean, anybody can be sued for anything, but if if a trainer that didn't have the extra certification or regulations intact was given out a meal plan and something happened, for example, a food allergy and the person got sick or God forbid worse, I mean, there's absolutely no question that that trainer will be held liable and negligent and would lose a lot of money if they had any. So that's not really the point. That could happen with anything. But the fact that like people can get away with that without like a, a, a regulatory board come in and saying you can't do this really is wrong. All right. Why? Health and fitness is big. I mean, here's one of the crazy things. I used to teach the American College of Sports Medicine certification um, program. So I would help students prepare, take the test and all that. It's not easy by any means. It's a, it's a really difficult certification, which is actually a good thing. I think it has like a 33% pass rate or something like that. So that shows it's pretty challenging. But the crazy part is, and even the students would bring this up and say, well, we're learning about this, but then technically that's outside of the scope of practice. And I'd say, well, you know, that's, that's a good point. So there we're, Trainers are in the situation where they are looking at different risks for cardiac disease. Like one of the foundational things that trainers learn early on is how to do an assessment screening. Now they're just supposed to screen, right? But how to do an assessment screen. So they're looking at risk factors of the individual that they're working with. So right off the bat, if a trainer is going the right road, like if they're being a professional trainer, like you should be, right off the bat, they're just not showing people how to do exercises, which by the way, needs to be taken serious, of course. But they're getting into cardiac risk factors, cardiac risk factors, the number one killer in the United States is heart disease. And you're having a trainer who is now looking at risk stratification of a person and this trainer isn't even licensed. Now, granted, they're just doing a screening, but still, this is important stuff. Now, sadly, that's best case scenario because some don't even do it. I mean, oftentimes, if you go to a gym, you know, you say, I want a trainer, and especially at these big box gyms, you know, it's just a total case of you're being upsold. And 
you know, it's, oh, we'll, we'll show you. And then the next thing you know, they'll say, well, you can sign up for this and that. And there's no screening whatsoever. So, like, it, it's, it's really just not a good scenario any way around it. But the ones who at least have been trained properly are really doing good assessments. And these assessments, like I said, they're risk stratification. So they're going to ask you about your family history. They're going to obviously know your age or hopefully ask you your age. They're going to be checking your blood pressure. They're going to check your resting heart rate. They're going to be checking your oxygen saturation rate in your blood. They're going to ask you to bring in your lipid profiles so they can look at your blood profiles or at least tell you to tell them what those numbers might be because years and years ago, the Framingham Heart Study came up with a risk stratification that can show you that how many risk factors you have and how it could add up and basically what your potential is to have a heart attack. Now, not that the trainer is going to be specifically working on that, but they're trained to know the stratification. So in other words, if a person has two or more modifiable risk factors, then they're supposed to get approval from their physician to work out, right? And that's a good thing. Like this is a really good stratification thing. It's just everybody being safe. It's everybody being smart. And it's not hard in this day and age to have more than two risk factors to make you at moderate risk. I mean, if you're over the age of 50 in a male, right there, bing, bang, you already have one. If you just happen to have one thing on your blood work off, like maybe your fasting glucose is above 100, well, that's two. Right there, you're already at moderate risk. Does that mean you're going to have a heart attack? No. It just means that based on the stratification, you should have the physician say, no, 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 they're good, they're good, their glucose is a little high, but we're looking at this, they're good to work out. So this is just an example of risk stratification and how important this stuff is. And wouldn't you want somebody licensed to really know what they're doing to work with you on these things, let alone the other half of this, which is all orthopedic stuff. So you got trainers like acting like physical therapists and they're not you got trainers given as i already said dietary advice and they shouldn't be i mean if you saw the scope of practice you would say oh this guy up at so-and-so violates this all the time that's not good that's not good there needs to be more professionalism okay there has to be more professionalism. So now let me tell you what I suggest we do about this because this is what I've been fighting for for a really, really, really long time. Licensing has its pros and cons. I'm not stupid. I know this, you know. I mean, you know, you, you get into licensing and then all of a sudden there are some things you have to make sure. I mean, it's not a bad thing, but there are things you have to make sure that you're doing that you maybe didn't do before. So there are reports you have to file. There's different things you have to do. I mean, ultimately, I don't see any of this as a bad thing personally. The other thing is, I mean, there could be more financial payment if there was licensing too, which would help out probably both parties. It would help out the trainers, I believe, and it would help out the clients. All right. Now, I'm a big believer in we can only control what we can control. So right now, there is not licensing in the state of Florida where I happen to reside. But there are standards that I want to teach you, the client, to look for. Make sure that your trainer has one of the big four of certifications because there are only four that are accredited. And accredited means there's an outside source that is grading the actual certification. You can't do it online and pass it. An accredited certification, you have to go to a test center where there's a proctor and take it without your phones, without computers, and all that. So that's one of the things. And then again, there's an outside party to make sure that the agency is following standard practice and protocol. So those four is the American College of Sports Medicine, or ACSM the National Strength and Conditioning Association, the NSCA, the American Council on Exercise, or ACE, and then National Academy of Sports Medicine, or NASM. Those are the four. There are no other accredited certifications. 
Those are the four. Make sure your trainer has one of them. The funny thing is, even though those trainers have been better trained, and I am a little biased towards the ACSM for sure because I do think it's the hardest and it's definitely the oldest. It goes back to 1954. Um, you know, I am biased towards them, but the bottom line is all four are good. But here's the funny thing. If you are trained under one of those, the trainers tend to stick to more what they're supposed to do anyway, even though they're really more capable and able to do more, they stick to it because they're smart. They don't go outside of their scope of practice. Personal trainers should not be giving marital advice. They should not be telling you exactly how to eat again unless they have additional training to it. They should not be performing rehab on you unless they have again additional training to do it. They definitely should not be giving you massages unless they're a licensed massage therapist. They should be not they should not be cracking your neck unless they're a licensed doctor of chiropractic. So there are those things that they know to stick to. It sounds like common sense, but you'd be amazed. I mean, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a gym and just shook my head on what a trainer's telling somebody. I mean, even on social media, the advice they give is, is just maddening what they do. I'm a big proponent in staying in the scope of practice. You know, I tell people to talk to their doctors about something that is not within my scope of practice. I work with the physicians a lot. I work with different physical therapists on things. I work with licensed massage therapists. I mean, Ellen's a licensed massage therapist here. There are obviously things that acquiesce to her. I mean, that is professionalism that we really, really need to stick to. So that's part one. Make sure that they have the appropriate level of accredited certification. Next, I mean, I hate to be biased, but, you know, look, I'm a big believer and lover of this field. I love health and fitness. I mean, it's a huge part of my life, you know, so I'm sorry, but I, I'm sorry, I'm not sorry. They should most likely have a degree. I think it's important to have a degree in the health and fitness world. Not always. I mean, I can always see where somebody with the right certification and experience can be very good, but it's always been my belief that if you really love it, like you say you do, you would go out of your way to get your degree. I mean, my first degree is in psychology and I was working as a counselor and I realized I wanted to get into the personal training uh, realm and I wanted to do it right. So I went back and got my master's because to me, I'm like, I want to know like what's underneath things. Like I don't want to just be trained in a certification, which is great. It's great. But I also want to know the sciences. I really want to understand completely and it's just really hard to beat four years of college, right? I mean, you're really taking the time to get well-trained. And I just think that says a lot when somebody has dedicated that much time to their life to get professional in what they do. So that's the second part. I just believe an education is really, really, really important. Maybe not 100% necessary, but very, very, very important. All right? So check those things out. And then the final thing is just stay attuned. I mean, if you see somebody on social media or at a gym somewhere giving out advice that sounds like they shouldn't be giving it out, you know, stay clear of that person. There's no quick fixes. They shouldn't be doing things for you that you can do for yourself. Like that's just basically telling customers something to try to lure customers in <clears throat> where I will do the opposite. I'm not going to do that. I make a very clear boundary of what I'm here to do and I teach the person what they need to do for themselves and anybody that's promising you quick fixes and all that is probably just looking to make a quick dime. All right. So we need professionalism out there. You all can help us by making sure that you demand it out there. Just demand it. Quit going and hiring people that don't have the credentials that are talking about things that they shouldn't be talking about. It really frustrates all of us because we have to go in and clean it up for somebody. You know, somebody will come to the gym and we'll say, no, that's not true. No, don't do that. No, you shouldn't be doing that exercise. Like if we had greater level of professionalism, I just think it would really help people go to the gyms and trust 
that everybody's getting the same scientific information and that's that is the beauty and the benefit of having sort of a gatekeeper out there watching over everything all right now let me thank overhead door of daytona beach the premier garage door company owned by jeff and zach hawk who i've known for many 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 years and they are consummate professionals if you need any help with service parts or garage doors give them a shout at overheaddoordaytona.com